Lindsay, I'm here um, along with my colleagues from the Healthy Minds Network. I uh, especially want to mention uh, Daniel Eisenberg and Sarah Lipson, who are the co principal investigators for this study. Uh, the, the goal today here is to start with a little bit of an introduction about who we are, and then I want to run through some of the data. And I'm going to start broad and narrow in. So I'm going to display some of the trends that we've seen over the last maybe 10 or 12 years. And then I want to share some about what we know of our respondents identifying as students of color or have uh, non majority majority identities, and then finally kind of really hone in on some specific data related to community colleges and specifically students of color attending those schools. So if we could have the next slide, please. Okay, so uh, on, on, a, on a broad scale, uh, the Healthy Minds Network is focused on how can we invest most effectively in mental health and well-being for college students. Uh, we, we do think of it as an investment uh, because we understand that there are limited resources, and that could be not just financial resources, but uh, people's time on campuses. And so, so how can we make the best use of resources to improve student health? And for us, uh, the answer tends to be starting from the bottom here and the, uh, the, the goal of collecting as much descriptive population level data as possible so that we can inform the design and evaluation of programs and, event and intervention. And from there, we can help schools make their most informed choice about what's going to work the, the best for their communities. And I, I want you to see the, the, the bi-directional arrows there and that this is not university researchers coming in and saying this is how things need to happen, but it really is a partnership with not only researchers, but practitioners, administrators, policymakers, and students themselves all having a voice. Next slide, please. So uh, the, the network has been developed over the years. It began with Daniel Eisenberg in about 2007, and since, since then has expanded in our partnerships and our co-investigators. Uh, but our primary goals here, you see, are producing knowledge through research uh, and distributing that knowledge, which seems like it might be a fairly straightforward task, but we find again and again um, that the dissemination of this information can be a holdup. And so we're trying actively to increase our ability to make this data available, make it accessible to participating schools, as well as others who might be able to, to uh, glean important information about student mental health from our data. And then ideally, the, the end goal is certainly to translate that, uh, that data into practice. Next slide, please. So the foundation of the network really was the original Healthy Minds study um, that I'll talk about. Um, uh, let's see here. I'm seeing the, or hopefully folks are seeing this map of different locations. So it began in 2005. It's an annual web-based survey. It's primarily cross-sectional data, although we do have some longitudinal cohorts. Uh, but over the years, we've had more than 300 schools, some which have participated uh, cons uh, consistently or uh, every other year, uh, reaching over 300,000 students. The, the approach is to take a random sample um, at larger institutions of, of students. At smaller institutions, we try to get a more uh, uh, inclusive or representative sample if we can, uh, but we understand that there are limited limitations to our sampling process, but doing the best that we can to have an accurate picture of each participating institution, which is then aggregated up to the national level. Uh, the surveys take about 20 to 30 minutes to complete. I'll acknowledge up front that that's research speak. I like to think that they take 20 to 30 minutes to complete, and we, tr we do try to think about uh, participant burden, but we understand um, that collecting this information takes time and that there is a cost to it, so we, we try to be sensitive of that. Um, but at the end of the survey, we, we do try to provide resources for our students um, about how they can um, access services or le learn a little bit more based on some of the information that we've heard from them. Next slide, please. So the, the core of the Healthy Mind study includes three modules um, that we collect from anybody who's participating. So those would include demographic information, uh, mental health status, so these would be things like depression, anxiety, and then a key part of what we do is service utilization and help-seeking behaviors as well. So we want to understand whether students have access to services on their campus, uh, whether they are able to approach or whether they, they, they see stigma on campus that might uh, present barriers for their service utilization, um, but we ask all of our participating students and institutions those three modules. Over time, we've developed a series of auxiliary modules that students can, or that institutions can opt to include as well. So the goal is to try to be specific to the needs of the institution. If they believe that their students might be struggling with substance use, 
we can bring in a substance use module. If there is concern about resilience and coping, we can bring in a resilience and coping model. And again, uh, the core of this, of this survey stays constant over time. The modules, we try to be as responsive as possible. Next slide, please. As an example, um, just this past year, we've developed a COVID-19 module. So recognizing from our partners that students were struggling during the pandemic, uh, we worked with the American College Health Association uh, to pilot and then implement in the spring and fall a module around specifically how has COVID affected your mental health and your, your academics? Um, have you missed school because of your own illnesses or family members? Has trauma associated with the pandemic impacted your mental health, those type of things? Has service utilization changed based on um, COVID and how it's been developing? So just an example of how these modules uh, come into being. We, we typically see a need or we are uh, uh, schools and partners communicate a need, and then we try to develop something that can be responsive. Next slide, please. So I won't spend too much time on this, but in those core modules, um, just some of the measures that I'm going to be presenting over the next few slides. So the, some of the key outcomes that we'll report in our national data reporting, and then we also have tailored reporting for each institution. So some of the highlights that we will, um, will, will bring to those reports are depression, overall depression, um, anxiety, eating disorders, um, suicidal, uh, suicide ideation, and um, uh, non-suicidal uh, self-injury stigma. So some common constructs that we think are important enough that they're always going to appear. But then we also give uh, institutions and um, anybody who's interested in accessing the data the ability to drill down a little bit further. But this is, these are some of the measures or some of the data that I'm going to present is going to be based off of these measures. And we can talk a little bit more about them in the questions if uh, people have them. Next slide, please. Uh, maybe one slide before. I'm on uh, how how HMS data are used to create change. There we go. Uh, so here the uh, just just so that we're all on the same page. And I would love to hear at the end of this how we can work with you to do so. Uh, a lot of where the strengths that we find for the Healthy Mind studies is the ability to raise awareness around mental health and campus resources, not just for the students attending, but for um, the, the broader public at large to understand that mental health is a concern for our college students. And it's not just something that's common for those who decide to, to pursue post-secondary study. Uh, we need to try to assess the need for program and services. So if there is a need on campus, can we help schools identify what that need is, and then they can tailor their efforts in, uh, based on those needs. Uh, we want to be advocates for mental health resources, services, and programs on campus. And you'll see that's one of the things that we struggle with. Um, I'm sure folks on the call see this as well. There's so much need and so much demand and often scarce resources in which to do that. So we want to make that problem explicit um, so that we can find operational solutions to that. Uh, evaluate existing programs. So for our repeat participants, if they implement some strategy or program to improve mental health on campus, if we have multiple years of data, we can see at least at the best uh, population level that we can estimate. Do we start to see some of those changes? Uh, we help schools do some benchmarking. So if they are interested to see how they are performing relative to their peers, we can provide some of that information. And then to the extent that we can as well, um, we're happy to have our data utilized in grant applications or policy making decisions. Um, for us, again, getting back to that dissemination point, uh, we don't want our data to just sit there on the website. We want people to actively use it, download it. It's free. We're trying to do our best to make it as accessible to everybody as possible. Next slide, please. All right, so as I said, I'm going to start broad and then start to narrow in. So I'm going to talk about some trends in the data that we're seeing. Um, you'll see that we, we, I have 2007 to 2019 here. Um, the reason being that 2020, uh, 2020, we're still starting to, uh, to collate and aggregate that data. I'll give you some numbers from 2020, but we also recognize that with COVID, there's a chance that it could be an outlier. But as you'll see, it, it, talking through these trends, you know, um, the the data that we're seeing from last year is kind of on par with what we might be expecting here. So this very first one is severe depressive symptoms. Um, you'll see that there's this increase uh, over time from 2007 up to uh, 2019. And in 2020, actually, the, the, the percentage was 21. These were students who screened at uh, 15 or above 
on the PSQ9. So this would correspond to what's typically considered moderate depression. Um, severe depression, I think, starts at uh, the threshold is about 20. These are self-reported um, depressive symptoms um, through the PSQ9. Um, but we have seen this concerning trend over time, especially starting about 2014, um, where the the percentage of students reporting um, has gone has gone up a fair amount and seems to continue to keep rising. Next slide, please. For uh, positive, I'm now looking at positive screen for any depression. So this would be a little bit lower threshold, which is why you can see the numbers jumping up a little bit. So this is anybody um, uh, who scored 10 or more on the PSQ-9. This would be um, kind of the lowest threshold for uh, screening for depression symptoms. Following a similar trend jumping up between in 2017, 2018, um, before leveling off a little bit, uh, in 2020 in the fall, that, that number was 39%. So if there is a COVID influence, it's only making this, uh, this problem a little bit worse for students. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, anxiety symptoms, this is using uh, the GAD7, is also seeing a similar trend. Again, 2016, 2017, and maybe we can talk about why that could have happened, um, thinking about some of the, uh, the socio-political things that might have been happening in that year, but we do see this increase that's similar to depressive symptoms um, and anxiety symptoms as well. Next slide, please. So just like with uh, the depressive symptomology, we also have a, a, the, the, the first slide of anxiety was more severe, um, a, a lower threshold for a positive screen for anxiety. Uh, we see that almost up to a third of our students uh, are reporting uh, at least a low screen for general anxiety disorder. That number in fall of 2020 was 34%. Next slide, please. And here we see uh, some data that we haven't collected quite as long, although it does go back to about 2013 now. Uh, the presence of eating disorder symptomology is also increasing on uh, campuses. Uh, we see now that up to one in 10 students or respondents are reporting um, th these symptoms. It was about 11% in 2020. Next slide, please. Thinking or uh, considering non-suicidal self-injury, um, given that you know NCSSI or NSSIs are associated with a variety of clinical disorders, we're not surprised to see this number increasing. But uh, we do see, in fact, from 2009 up to the most recent year, uh, 2020, I think, was around 23%. Um, but a consistent increase in uh, self-injury over the last 10 years or so. Next slide, please. Suicide, suicide ideation also increasing across uh, our, our general population of students over the last 10 years. Next slide, please. Now here's kind of flipping on its head. Um, here we have uh, those reporting that uh, they sought or were utilizing therapy or counseling services. So, uh, and a positive here, we're, I mean, we're seeing more students having access to service. Uh, the underlying trend here, whether that's because more students are requiring service or more students are having access to service, is difficult to tease out. Um, but in generally, uh, generally speaking, we see about a third of students uh, telling us that in the past uh, year or the year that they took the uh, um, the survey that they've had access to to survey or to serve, excuse me. And then, uh, critically, next slide, please. For those students that have screened positive, um, we also asked or we tried to assess whether or not they've had access to services. Um, and you can see of those that screen positive, um, only about a third are telling us that they have had access to services. Now, we, we don't necessarily say that um, services are required. There are a lot of different ways that students may choose um, to, uh, to cope with uh, their, their challenges. But at the same time, uh, we would like to see those numbers continue to increase although there has been a steady increase since um, the, about 2009, 2010. Next slide, please. And although we don't necessarily think of, uh, of, of positive it has to be a, a, a polar opposite to, um, to other symptomology, we are seeing that uh, positive mental health, or what we'll call flourishing, um, has been decreasing since we started assessing in about 2012. Um, such that prior about 60% of students uh, reported positive mental health, whereas now um, that, that number is closer to about 40%. Next slide, please. 
Now, one promising trend we are seeing is within our, our stigma data. So this is uh, asking respondents what they think of someone who is seeking um, mental health services. And we saw that number was fairly low a decade ago, and it continues to go down, although they will, I'll show you that there are some differences by um, respondent identity that might be influencing some of these numbers. But uh, generally speaking, stigma seems to be decreasing across our sample uh, in 2020, it was about 6%. Next slide, please. Keeping those numbers in that last slide in mind, which were around 6%, this is how I might think of others seeking mental health services. Um, when we think about other people and what they think of mental health services, you can see that this idea around stigma and mental health is still very present on campuses. So students think that other people view mental health services and access uh, um, more negatively than we would hope. Next slide, please. Are you seeing reasons for not seeking treatment? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so just uh, so some of the uh, reasons that people report for not seeking treatment, um, uh, either choose to deal with uh, the issues on their own, um, perceive stress, and so trying to debunk this myth that stress is a normal part of college and therefore um, we, we, shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't be prioritizing. Still with me? Uh, Justin, you, you were fading out a bit. Could you could you repeat yourself? Oh, uh, just uh, uh, the reasons for not seeking treatment. Uh, I'll, I'll let folks read them, but uh, so just some of the reasons why students report um, they did not decide to seek treatment. And thinking about places where there's an intervention, for example, trying to debunk the myth that stress is a normal part of college and therefore, you know, feeling sad or lonely or isolated um, is what everybody goes through. So trying to uh, promote those resources and understandings for, for students. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so continuing to funnel, so we started broad trends. Now let's move down to specifically um, some of, of our non-majority populations relative to our white students. Uh, here you have the, some of our four main outcomes, depression, anxiety, eating disorders, and suicidal ideation um, by race and ethnicity. Um, so I flagged, I, even though I have the bolded, um, that's just to, to draw attention where there are differences. When we have large samples, if we want to talk statistical significance, huge samples, small standard errors. So these probably are statistically significant. Um, but ideally, we would, would have a representative enough sample that these are almost population level estimates. Um, and we do believe that there are some important differences in for example, depressive symptomology, anxiety symptoms um, among our um, BIPOC students relative to white students. Next slide, please. So related factors that uh, we just wanna highlight. So some experiences of discrimination, um, notice for African-American students um, are reporting some of the highest uh, experiences. Two out of three uh, students, African-American students are reported some form of discrimination. Um, we recognize that there are uh, both overt and some um, covert bias intersectionality. So, so um, our BIPOC students that might also um, identify as LGBT might be, might be experiencing discrimination in multiple contexts. Um, there are unique challenges that our BIPOC students are facing in, in college um, that could be related to some of that, uh, some of that uh, disparity in symptomology that I reported in the last slide, um, in addition to just the, the natural stress process of attending college and balancing all those new responsibilities and the, uh, the, the emerging adulthood storm and stress if you want to buy into um, that argument. Uh, but some of the protective factors that we find, uh, inclusive environments, uh, physical spaces and organizations for students, um, and then counseling staff. <laughs> Next slide, please. Here, this uh, a primary thing I wanted to highlight is uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier um, these ideas around stigma and that there could be group differences. Note here, this is uh, uh, help seeking attitudes and behaviors. And this is something that we've seen across our data that uh, our uh, Asian American students uh, tend to report um, higher levels of stigma around mental health services and might be less likely to, to, to seek out um, services. 
Next slide, please. Um, just to think about uh, U.S. citizens versus international students. International students tend to report more personal as well as perceive more stigma um, than U.S. Um, students. Next, please. And then also our uh, uh, gender minority students um, and sexual orientation, uh, we see uh, pretty consistently, as I imagine folks have seen across the data, um, that uh, gender minority students um, suffer from some of the, 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 the most, uh, the highest uh, uh, levels of depression and anxiety, um, eating disorders, suicidal ideation. Next slide, please. And uh, just like with uh, students of, of color, uh, students that identify as, as gender or sexual minorities um, do face discrimination. And we think a lot, many of the same issues that might be um, affecting our students of color could also be affecting uh, students that are um, non-majority in terms of gender identity, sexual orientation, with a couple of unique challenges, for example, things like housing, um, policies that are on campus, um, as well as policies that are happening um, and conversations that are happening at the national level. Next slide, please. How am I doing on time here, Valerie? You're doing fine. We can we can shift things around a bit, and this is such important information. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I'm, I'm almost there. I'm almost to the community college, or the reason why we're all here, folks. Uh, so suicide ideation by gender identity. Uh, but just wanted you to see. Um, that first of all, we do see much, much higher levels uh, relative to their cisgender peers, but even within um, gender minority categories, um, the, the, the distribution is relatively even. So there's, um, there's concern across um, many different gender identities about their suicidal ideation. Next slide, please. And then thinking again about stigma and perceived stigma, um, they, um, the difference between personal stigma versus what they think other people think um, is, is striking to me. Next slide. So I know that was a lot of data to go over in a short amount of time. I just wanted folks to see where we were going from a trend perspective, to see some of those increasing trends, to see that BIPOC students and uh, gender and sexual minorities tended to have a larger share of the mental health burden. Um, and we're gonna see that reflected in our data specifically from community colleges. Next slide, please. So I was able to pull data from our 2019, 2020 year, which was about 90,000 students, um, 7,000 of whom attended community colleges. So you have to take this with a little bit of a grain of, of, grain of salt. Um, we have, so we're, we're extrapolating from about 7,000 participants here, but what we do see, so here are so these key outcomes again, depression screen, anxiety screen, uh, therapy utilization, and in parentheses, if you screen positive for either depression and anxiety, do you have access to services or did you access services at the time that you, were, uh, you took the survey? And then suicide ide uh, suicidal ideation. And you can see relative to the national sample, community college uh, participants reporting more uh, positive depression screens, anxiety screens, less therapy utilization, um, and even if they had a positive screen, less therapy utilization, and higher levels of suicide ideation. Now, within community college participants, breaking down by race and ethnicity, um, we see some just differences between um, Black, uh, American Indian, Indigenous, and Alaskan Native sample, uh, participants, those identifying as Asian, um, Hispanic, or Latinx, uh, Pacific Islander, uh, and Middle Eastern. I'll just give folks, I know this is where folks want to, uh, the purpose of the call, just give you some time to, um, to take a look at this. I flag those cells that are higher um, than the national, the, national, um, the national data, or in the case of therapy uh, utilization, a little bit lower than the national data. For reference, uh, the for uh, community college uh, st uh, students who identified as white, uh, depression was about 41%, anxiety was about 36%, therapy utilization was 29 and 38% respectively, so a little bit higher, and suicidal ideation was about 18%. So white students are um, are hanging pretty close in there with the uh, the community college averages or total. Next slide, please. 
And then here we have suicidal ideation, non-suicidal self-injury, flourishing, um, and academic impairment. So this is uh, people telling us that um, for more than a week, um, their mental health has impaired their ability to, to be students or to uh, be um, productive students. So we see, once again, that for community colleges, um, the population is, it tends to be uh, higher suicide ideation and self-injury than the national sample. Uh, flourishing is right around the same, um, and academic impairment is roughly the same. Um, but when, as soon as we get into the breakdown by race and ethnicity, we start to see some of those differences there. And that's what I have. Uh, so thank you for, for, for listening. I'm happy to take some of your questions again. Uh, we know this data is not perfect, but we want to try to, to share this data, um, to think critically about this data and um, to, to make it useful for, for folks who are interested. So I'd be happy to hear your feedback or again, answer any of your questions. I thank you for your attention. Justin, thank you so much. Um, I know we had a couple of questions coming in through the chat as you were speaking um, and Yes, um, Maura, we will be sending around um, these slides as well as some additional resources following the meeting. Um, I saw some questions come in from John Dunkel, so I'd love to invite you to start um, off with your questions and just some overall parameters for folks. We have about eight minutes um, for questions here, but if there are others, <laughs> we can come back and follow up with those afterwards as well. John, would you like to start us off? Well, actually, I have a new question, so I won't do the other ones. Um, th thank you so much, Justin. This is very helpful and, and very informative. Um, I'm wondering if the uh, the BIPOC community college student data that you just shared, what the age, how that compares to the national sample? Are they older? Are they about the same age range, same um, mean? Because, you know, having worked in, in college setting for a long time, the st older students tend to have more of a history. So I wonder if there's also a piece of that there. I'm just curious what the age range was. Yeah, and, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a specific range for you, John, but you're right. I, I, I would say in general, our community college uh, population tends to be older than our uh, the national sample average. I'm happy to run that data for this sample though, and we can share it with uh, Valerie and she can disseminate. Yeah, okay, thank you. And, that would lead me to believe that they probably have other, a lot more stressors as well, including family and, and other types of things, obviously. So thank you. Yeah. Other questions for Justin? Hi, I'm Justin. Thank you so much for the information. I just had a question. Um, how was the survey um, distributed? Um, I'm at a community college in Boston and we've done the Hope Lab um, survey on um, food insecurity and housing insecurity, but I hadn't heard about this one um, from the Healthy Minds Network. Sure, so our team works with a representative on campus, whether that's uh, a counseling office, the registrar, uh, to develop the sampling frame. The sampling frame typically is if for larger schools, um, 2,500 to about 3,000 students. Um, for smaller schools, it can vary a little bit. Um, but once we've done that, or once we have the, the list of students um, that we're trying to draw from, we'll use a random, uh, a random selection procedure to, um, to reach out to those students it's usually in concordance with some messaging from the college or university um, that's participating with us. So it might come from their um, Office of Student Life. Um, but then we work with participants. It's a Qualtrics survey um, that they're responding to. So our, our sampling strategy is, is in some ways dictated by our partners in terms of the, the student list that they give us. Um, but that's the way that we approach it once we have those lists. Did that answer your question? Yes, it did, but I have one more follow-up. How do we get on that list? <laughs> Be interesting to for, um, have the survey and then we can use it for some um, decisions based on the data. Um, right, please. well, so the, I'm sorry, please. 
Did I interrupt you, Lisa? I'm sorry. So yeah, I mean, the, the survey itself is available for uh, anyone to download. You're welcome to, to pull it for the website. Uh, if you are interested in trying to bring Healthy Minds to your university uh, or to your college, we are happy to have those conversations. Um, we do uh, charge a, a fee to provide the services, mostly for the administrative cost of the service. Um, but we uh, we work with schools to make that possible. Um, and we understand that for many schools, the, the, the resources in order to provide this survey um, might be scarce. And so we can have conversations about what we can do to help you bring this or even to conduct um, something similar on your own um, to, to campus. So I'd be more than happy to have a conversation with you about what, uh, what we can do if you're interested in bringing this to, to campus. I was just going to say hello. Um, this is Mara. We are from Cape Cod Community College, and um, we did the Healthy Minds study at our college, like in 2018. And we have all the data, but I like the way that uh, it was presented here because when we got our um, print out of it, don't I don't know that I'll have to get someone to break it down into. Um, ethnicity and stuff because and so my concern is uh, I, I don't know if you can see the data from, from BIPOC. I see that only 9% of the people that filled out the survey identified you know as um, African American and then 9% Hispanic but I don't want to uh, misconstrue the information you know I, I wonder if there's a way to look more into the data and see if we can get a more of a standing of which population filled out what answers and maybe that would help with our data. Uh, and just for Lisa, hi Lisa, I see you at another meeting. Um, we also did it through um, the Jed Foundation uh, when we were starting a project. So we're pretty excited and then there'll be a follow-up study in two years, but really interesting, Justin, how you presented it. Would love to see if I can you know, get into the data more and, and come up with the answer. Yeah, and it's a it's a good point. Very nice to meet you. Uh, I I would say um, feedback is is very much appreciated. So what we've we've dedicated a lot of time and effort over the last couple of years to um, to create a website that would allow people to pull data and to generate some of this this information and some of these reports. Um, that might work for uh, uh, maybe. Uh, prevalence estimates or population level estimates. But when it comes to specific schools working with their data, there might be, uh, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm thinking uh, scripts that we can help to develop so that people can um, run reports more easily. So we're, we're not just assuming right. that um, each participating institution has a data manager that can spend you know, as much time as we get to combing through some of the data. So. Um, I'd be, I'd, I'd love to hear some feedback and maybe we can chat offline about um, some of the questions that you're trying to ask. And if it's pulling data like this, um, we can maybe give you some guidance on how to uh, yeah, stratify your so sample I, and the, get some of this information. Yeah, because yeah, for me, it was like 70%, 77% uh, white filled out the survey. So if I'm making the comment that, you know, X amount attend wellness or mental health services, it doesn't really help me to determine whether or not our BIPOC students are part of that percentage or how many of them actually do it. So it would be interesting for me to try to niggle it down to that. Yeah, please feel free to reach out and we can uh, we, we can see if we can help you get to, to where you want to go. I, I guess my question would be, because uh, I'm big on the numbers thing, is if, if you present it as such today, is it truly representative of and people of color that would use the services or are you just taking the top number? No, yeah. so representativeness is, is, a, is a big concern for us. So when we present um, our data, we, we provide both raw data as well as survey weights so that we can try to have, when you, when you talk about aggregate estimates, um, you're essentially giving more value to um, under respondents. And so you can compare what we think would have happened if you had the entire population at a specific school or across the country relative to what we see within the raw data. 
um, for, as, in some cases, our approaches has been to oversample um, particular subpopulations of interest. So at times, for example, at, at U of M, our Healthy Mind survey, we've oversampled Asian American students or we've oversampled African American students because we're specifically looking for um, those voices to, to be um, represented within the data. And so that's a strategy that could be implemented too, again, working with um, specific schools about their individual needs and how we would sample from their bar student population. But just because we even oversample, one thing that we do know is uh, there's often underreporting from um, our non-majority students. So uh, we have just lower response rates. And so what can we do to encourage students to speak up? Um, and that might be true too of our community colleges in general, the response rates, they vary quite a bit across um, institutions. Um, but trying to improve response rates is going to make that generalizability question that you asked um, uh, less less of a concern. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, these really thoughtful responses and for your presentation. I was watching people's faces as you were speaking and seeing um, a lot of nodding, a lot of recognition that um, you know this this data aligns with with so much of what people are seeing um, in their daily work, and I know that there is is so much more to do. So um, I want to I want to make sure we stay on track to move into our small group sessions. But please know that in the resource list that we'll be sending out after today's event will include contact information um, for everybody who has agreed to share their contact information. Um, and we will also have have some additional resources and ideas around um, 